What is going on, wonderful people? It's Medicosis Perfectionaris, where medicine makes perfect sense. This video is brought to you by TrueLearn. TrueLearn is a question bank with thousands of questions, answers, and explanations. See the link in the description box to get a discount towards your subscription. In previous videos, we had TrueLearn cases on cardiology, nephrology, biochemistry, and more. Today, we shall talk about some pharmacology cases. So grab a sheet of paper and let's see how many of these cases you'll answer correctly. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. You'll find this link in the description box as well as in the first comment. So here is case number one. A 60-year-old man presents to the emergency room with sudden onset of shorts of breath and headache. About five hours ago, he was working outside on the family farm and felt well until about 20 minutes prior to his presentation in the emergency room. He has no history of lung disease and has never smoked. On physical examination, he is working hard to breathe and shaking on the exam table. Auscultation of his lungs reveal poor air movement and rolls. The remainder of the examination is unremarkable. He has non-productive cough throughout the exam. Chest x-ray shows diffuse airspace consolidation. He's placed on supplemental oxygen and appropriately treated, leading to a complete resolution of his symptoms within six hours. Which of the following treatments was most likely used? Is it A, atropine, B, beta agonist inhaler, C, corticosteroids, D, chromolin, or E, omalizumab? Feel free to pause the video and try to solve this vignette yourself. First, before we can answer the question about the treatment, we have to understand and find the diagnosis first. What do you think the diagnosis is? This is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It's a hypersensitivity reaction. There is inflammation of the lungs. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is otherwise known as extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Why extrinsic? Because I'm exposed to something coming from outside my body. Why allergic? Because it's allergic. Alveolitis means inflammation of the alveoli. And of course, the alveoli are in the lungs. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is caused by inhalational exposure to a known or knowable organic antigen or antigens, triggering an inflammatory response, and that's why we have an itis and an itis, in the alveoli and small airways. The antigen is going to enter my body through the respiratory system. It's going to sensitize me, triggering my T helper lymphocytes to react, and don't forget that the T helper lymphocytes love to help others, such as the B lymphocytes. Now the B lymphocytes are active, so they will become plasma cells. Plasma cells will secrete antibodies. In this case, it's mostly IgG, and this is why I have an immune response. Hey, medicosis, is hypersensitivity pneumonitis the same as hay fever? Hay fever, how are you? No, 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 no. Hay fever is not the same as hypersensitivity pneumonitis. For hay fever, is type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. However, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is mostly type 3. Hay fever is type 1, which means it's all about IgE and eosinophils. But that's not the case with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis has no IgE, no eosinophilia, because it's not type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is associated with many occupations, especially farmers, carpenters, bird owners, tobacco growers, industrial workers, machine operators, even sauna takers, hot tub users. It's all about a bunch of organic antigens. These antigens could include fungal antigens, such as moldy hay, bacterial or mycobacterial antigens, bird-derived antigens, some chemicals, wood, that's why carpenters, coffee, mold, and more. Note that all of these are organic antigens. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, plural is hypersensitivity pneumonitides, is a broad term. It's an umbrella term that includes many individual diseases, such as farmer's lung, bird fancier's lung, chemical worker's lung, miller's lung, cheese washer's lung, coffee maker's lung, tobacco grower's lung, and sauna taker's lung. Some of these diseases are obstructive lung diseases, such as farmer's lung. Other diseases of hypersensitivity pneumonitis are restrictive lung diseases, such as bird fancier's lung. But for the most part, they tend to be more restrictive than obstructive. If it's farmer's lung, then the antigen is thermophilic actinomycetes, or aspergillus. If it's bird fancier's lung, then proteins derived by parakeets and pigeons. How can we manage farmer's lung, avoid the exposure to the antigen, wear a mask, 
And if the reaction happens, because this reaction has itis, it's inflammation, and because this reaction has an immune response, then you can give the patient an anti-inflammatory and an immunosuppressant, such as corticosteroids. So what do you think the answer here is? If you say the answer is corticosteroids, you're absolutely correct. Why is that? Because this patient has hypersensitivity pneumonitis, so we need to give an anti-inflammatory that happens to be immunosuppressive. How about atropine? No, atropine is different. Atropine is anti-muscarinic. It inhibits the muscarinic receptors that belong to acetylcholine. Beta agonist inhaler is neither anti-inflammatory nor immunosuppressive. Chromolin sodium is a mast cell stabilizer. Again, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is not type 1 hypersensitivity, so we're not going to use chromolin. How about omalizumab? If it ends in MAB, it's a monoclonal antibody. Monoclonal antibody against whom? Against IgE. Again, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is not type 1 hypersensitivity, so we're not going to use omalizumab. Case number two. A 63-year-old man comes to the emergency department because of a one-hour history of changes in his vision and indigestion. He also has had a headache during the past week. He has a history of congestive heart failure, erectile dysfunction, latent tuberculosis, and atrial fibrillation. He frequently flies internationally for work and recently returned from a trip to South Africa. He is unable to recall the names of his medications. He says that one week ago he started taking a new medication that was prescribed by his primary care physician. Temperature is 37 Celsius, 98.6 Fahrenheit, pulse is 62 per minute, respirations are 14 per minute, and blood pressure is 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Pulse oximetry shows an oxygen saturation of 99%. During the examination, he identifies a green index card as blue and does the same for a yellow highlighter. Which of the following is the mechanism of action of the drug that is most likely causing these symptoms? Is it A, inhibits arabinozole transferase, B, inhibits heme polymerase, C, inhibits sodium potassium ATPase, D, inhibits phosphodiesterase type 5, or E, inhibits voltage-gated potassium channels? First of all, what's going on here? The patient is seeing blue. Everything appears blue to this patient. The patient is taking medications for CHF, erectile dysfunction, latent tuberculosis, and AFib. So, so what are the possibilities here? Well, the possibility is that he's taking Viagra or a similar drug. One of the side effects of sildenafil, which is a medication used to treat erectile dysfunction, is to cause visual changes where things appear blue in front of my eyes. So this patient is probably taking sildenafil. What's the mechanism of action of sildenafil? Is it A, inhibits arabinozole transferase? The answer is no, because A is talking about ethambutol, which is a medication used to treat tuberculosis. But ethambutol will make me see red-green. It's a red-green discoloration or red-green color blindness, but it's not blue. So A is out. How about B? Inhibits heme polymerase. Well, sildenafil does not do that. If you happen to know a name of a medication that inhibits heme polymerase, please let me know in the comments. C. Inhibits sodium potassium ATPase. What is that describing? This is describing digoxin or digitalis. It can also describe beta blockers. But that's not sildenafil, so that's out. How about D? Inhibits phosphodiesterase type 5. This is correct. This is how sildenafil, tadenafil, vardenafil work. How about E? Inhibits voltage-gated potassium channels. No. E is probably describing potassium channel blockers. So the correct answer here is D. Please recall that in smooth muscles, such as the muscles in your blood vessel wall, contain myosin light chain. If this myosin light chain is attached to a phosphate group, it is active. By active mean it's contracting, and when the vessel is contracting, it is constricting, vasoconstriction. However, if you remove that phosphate from the myosin light chain, you'll end up with myosin light chain without a phosphate. How do you remove a phosphate? You need a phosphatase enzyme to remove that phosphate. When you remove the phosphate from the myosin light chain, it becomes passive and relaxed, and the vessel will dilate. And this is exactly how sildenafil, tadenafil, vardenafil work. They remove the phosphate by stimulating a phosphatase enzyme. So how does that work exactly? Well, sildenafil, tadenafil, vardenafil will inhibit phosphodiesterase 5. But let's go back to square one. 
what is the natural, normal function of phosphodiesterase 5 before it is inhibited by any medication. Normally, phosphodiesterase 5 breaks down cyclic GMP into pieces of trash called degradation products. So basically, phosphodiesterase 5 inactivates cyclic GMP. Okay. But what was the function of cyclic GMP in the first place? It activates protein kinase G, which activates phosphatase, which removes the phosphate group from myosin light chain to convert it from active to inactive, from a constricted vessel to a dilated vessel. So therefore, by inhibiting the degradation of cyclic GMP via sildenafil to denafil vardenafil, we're boosting cyclic GMP because no one will take it to the cleaners anymore. Cyclic GMP will continue to persist to activate the protein kinase G even more, activate phosphatase, remove the phosphate group from the mice and light chain so that it becomes inactive and relaxed and the vessels will dilate. This is true for smooth muscles in blood vessels anywhere in the body. Also, for erectile tissue, such as the corpora cavernosa in the male organ. When these vessels dilate, what's going to happen? Erection. And that's why sildenafil to denafil vardenafil can be used to treat impotence or erectile dysfunction in males. But of course, if they dilate blood vessels everywhere, we're not going to be totally surprised if they start to cause visual changes. Next question, a 39-year-old man comes to the emergency department because of a three-week history of intermittent fevers, fatigue, and cough. The patient has no chronic medical conditions and does not take any medications. He was recently released from prison after serving a five-year sentence. He smokes one pack of cigarettes per day but does not drink alcoholic beverages or use illicit drugs. His temperature is 37.9 Celsius, 100.3 Fahrenheit. Pulse is 96 per minute. Respirations are 14 per minute. Blood pressure is 115 over 80 millimeters of mercury. Chest x-ray shows an apical right lung infiltrate and sputum cultures grow mycobacterium tuberculosis. Resistance testing is performed and show resistance to only isoniazid. Which of the following best explains the antimicrobial resistance that was observed in these bacteria? Is it A, decreased activity of bacterial catalase peroxidase? B, increased activity of bacterial enzyme involved in the cell wall polysaccharide production? C, structural alteration of bacterial dihydropteroate synthase? D, structural alteration of the bacterial RNA polymerase? Or E, structural alteration of the bacterial 30S ribosomal subunit? Please pause and try to answer this yourself. The correct answer here is A because this is a famous mechanism by which the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria can resist the action of the isoniazid medication. They do so by decreasing the activity of bacterial catalase peroxidase, which is encoded by a gene known as CAT-G. G for gene, CAT for catalase. Why is that? Because in order for isoniazid to be active, it requires the presence of the bacterial catalase peroxidase in order to become active, in order to destroy the tuberculosis bacteria. However, if the bacteria decrease the activity of bacterial catalase peroxidase, then isoniazid will not get activated and will not be efficient, which means the bacteria wins. We call this resistance. What was the mechanism of action of isoniazid? It's a mycolic acid inhibitor. It inhibits the mycolic acid, which is a component of the cell wall of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. How about the anti-tuberculosis drug ethambutol? It inhibits arabinozole transferase, which inhibits the formation of arabinogalactan, which is also a component of the cell wall of mycobacterium tuberculosis. As for rifampin, it inhibits the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which normally converts DNA into mRNA. If this is destroyed, then the tuberculosis will not be able to synthesize proteins. In order for isoniazid to work, it requires the presence of bacterial catalase peroxidase, which is coded for by CAT-G gene. Next, an 18-year-old woman comes to her physician for a physical exam before university. Part of the screening requires that she receives a PPD skin test. She does not have a cough, fever, weight loss, or any known tuberculosis exposure risk. She has never received the BCG vaccine, never traveled outside the country, temperature is within normal limits, heart rate is 72 per minute, respiratory rate 12 per minute, blood pressure 116 over 76 millimeters of mercury. Her physical examination shows no abnormalities. 
The PPD skin test is administered and she returns in 72 hours for evaluation. The area of induration around the injection is 9 millimeters. A history of which of the following risk factors would warrant further evaluation in this patient? Is it A, asthma, B, chronic renal failure, C, Crohn disease treated with azathioprine, D, intravenous drug use, or E, leukemia? Please pause the video. The correct answer here is Crohn's disease treated with azathioprine. Now, why is that? Because azathioprine is an immunosuppressive drug. It suppresses the immune system. And when it suppresses the immune system, it can do what? It can reactivate a tuberculosis infection in my body. A 9 millimeter in duration, while not the biggest in duration, is also not trivial. So, if the patient is taking azathioprine, now this increases the risk. Where should I put azathioprine? Azathioprine is one of these synthetic DMARs, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which are used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. We divide the DMARs into synthetic and biological. Both groups can weaken my immune system and reactivate tuberculosis in my body. How does azathioprine work? Azathioprine gets converted to 6-mercaptopurine, and then 6-mercaptopurine will inhibit the synthesis of purines. Purines and pyrimidines are part of DNA and RNA. And this is true for all of your cells, including your lymphocytes. So if your lymphocytes cannot make purines, therefore you will have decreased lymphocyte functions. And this can weaken your immune system. Now, I have good news, I have bad news. Good news, if you have an immunological disease like Crohn's disease, your symptoms might improve. The bad news is, if you have an infection that is hiding in your body, like tuberculosis, it can reactivate when you suppress your immune system. And that's why the correct answer to the previous question is Crohn's disease treated with azathioprine. Next, question 5. A 22-year-old woman presents to the office with complaints of shorts of breath and wheezing for the past 5 months. She reports episodes of dyspnea wheezing that are associated with exercise, especially when being outdoors. She has had a persistent non-productive nocturnal cough during the same time. She has no history of recent illness and denies fever, chills, body aches, rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, and sputum production. She had eczema as a child. She has no other medical conditions, does not take any medications, does not use tobacco. Vital signs are within normal limits. On physical examination, expiration is mildly prolonged, and there are scattered wheezes. Which of the following patterns are most likely to be seen on pulmonary function testing in this patient? Is it A, B, C, D, E, or F? So this is your quiz today. Let me know what you think the answer should be in the comment section. In True Learn Question Bank, in the explanation under each question, sometimes you'll find tables like this. For example, this table is explaining clearly the high yield bullet points for your exam. For example, Marfan syndrome is associated with fibrillin-1 mutation and increased TGF-beta. These are the clinical features and the complications. Again, check the link in the description box. And in the explanation for many of the questions, you find integration with picmonics. These are animated video mnemonics to help you remember. For example, this is Marfan syndrome. Fibrillin-1 mutation is the FROG1 mutation. It's an autosomal dominant disease, dominoes. It's characterized by pectus excavatum, the excavator, arachne dactyly, spider-like fingers, mitral valve prolapse, here is the mitral valve prolapsing, and aortic regurgitation. As for the eye lens, it has subluxation, the submarine. TrueLearn.com has question banks. If you're preparing for USMLE, complex, physician assistant exams, anesthesiology, emergency medicine, family medicine, general surgery, internal medicine, neurology, OBGYN, pediatric psychiatry, dental hygiene, medical assisting, nursing, nurse practitioner, PT and OT, pharmacy, pharmacy technician, and speech language pathology. TrueLearn.com has thousands of questions. You can even sort by difficulty. For example, you can create a question bank block that only contains the easiest questions, level 1, or the hardest questions, level 10, or anything in between. You can answer questions on a specific topic. For example, you decide that the questions will be on tuberculosis, or influenza, or staph aureus, etc. The explanations have summary tables, 
they will let you know your percentage and percentile and the explanation integrates with Picmonic. I will never recommend anything to you that I have not tried myself. I've answered many questions. They will tell you how many questions you answered correctly percentage wise and then they rank you against other students and give you the percentile. Look here, my last exam was about influenza. So the entire block was only on one topic, influenza virus. You can try TrueLearn for free if you use the link below. You can subscribe to TrueLearn and Picmonic together in one bundle. And if you use my discount code Medicosis, or if you click on the link in the description box, you will receive a discount towards your subscription. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you TrueLearn for sponsoring this video. Check the link in the description and in the first comments, and I will see you later in a similar video. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.